smile upon your hurting children and turn stone hearts warm with your love. Blessed be your name through all the earth. Blessed be the spirit of your compassionate word. Will you pray with me? Oh God, in this season of Lent, we pray that we may all be given the grace and strength to repent and grow closer to you, O oh God. Create in us clean hearts 
and renew a right spirit within us. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from Lamentations chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, and then 20 through 21. How the Lord in his anger has humiliated daughter Zion. He has thrown down from heaven to earth the splendor of Israel. He has not remembered his footstool on the day of his anger. The Lord has destroyed without mercy all the dwellings of Jacob. In his wrath, he has broken down the strongholds of daughter Judah. He has brought down to the ground and dishonor the kingdom and its rulers. He has cut down in fierce anger all the might of Israel. He has withdrawn his right hand from them in the face of the enemy. He has burned like a flaming fire in Jacob, consuming all around. He has bent his bow like an enemy, with his right hand set like a foe. He has killed all in whom we took pride in the tent of daughter Zion. He has poured out his fury like fire. The Lord has become like an enemy. Look, O Lord, and consider, to whom have you done this? Should women eat their offspring, the children they have born? Should priest and prophet be killed in the sanctuary of the Lord? The young and the old are lying on the ground in the streets. My young women and my young men have fallen by the sword. On the day of your anger, you have killed them, slaughtering without mercy. You invited my enemies from all around, as if for a day of festival. And on the day of the anger of the Lord, no one escaped or survived. Those whom I bore and reared my enemy had destroyed. May the peace of Christ dwell where the word of God is spoken. We are in the middle of our Lenten series, Learning to Lament. 
Lament is the spiritual practice of expressing our grief and our sorrow before God. These laments manifest themselves in a variety of ways in scripture. In the Psalms, we see writers pouring their hearts out to God in anguish, frustration, grief, sorrow, and even anger. Which got me thinking about my responses to anger. As many of you know, as a child, I was raised by my grandfather, so I had very little experience with anger. I, th I think about, uh, our, I, I tried to like recall the times when I saw my grandfather angry, and I can honestly say I think it was maybe two or three times at most. And so when I would experience this, this well of anger, I really didn't know what to do with it because I didn't see him do much at all. So I would hold it in and I'd go into my room and eventually that would become a whole bunch of tears. Which is why I told Carol last week that God's just gonna need a bigger jar to collect all of my tears than what she had. You see, for a long time, I'm not sure that I really knew how to distinguish my less appealing emotions. That is, until I reached high school and college and I discovered the beautiful art of expressing my words, my anger through words, also known as ranting. I have been known to dive deep into long rants about things that have made me mad, such as when someone is in the express lane with too many items, or I've been cut off in traffic, I am from Houston, you know, or when perhaps I went to Walmart and they didn't have the right type of toothpaste, or I was passed up for a job. No matter how big or how small, using my words to express my anger became my tool for quick release. Now my best friend whom I lived with through college knew me well and would let me rant and rant for about 15 minutes or so and express my very opinionated and obviously biased opinion and then she would simply utter the words, I know, that's awful. Well that worked great for me until I no longer lived with my best friend and I married Bryce. And the first time I went to Walmart and they were out of my favorite toothpaste and he got to be the recipient of my 15 minute long rant about how Walmart was no longer carrying the toothpaste I liked. And Bryce and his wonderful analytical problem solving self gave me, said Brittany, there's like seven other stores you can go to to find this toothpaste. You see, I realized then that there are different ways that people express their anger and perhaps a list of five or seven ways to respond to it is not what I needed at the time. Well, I've carried that over too into my response to God. I've noticed that when I am feeling angry, I don't feel comfortable expressing that with God. I try to hold it in and I think it's because I'm afraid if I rant to God, God's going to give me a list of five or seven things and say, go to another Walmart. But this season of Lent, as we're learning to lament, I'm envisioning and I'm trying to practice exploring what it means to rant to God, to complain about how angry I am when I see school shootings and how mad I am when my aunt has to undergo a different kind of chemo treatment and picturing God simply uttering the words, I know, that's awful. So take a moment and reflect. In your bulletin, there's some space to write, if you will, on these questions. As a child, what were your family's rules about expressing anger? And what is your comfort level with expressing anger before God?
So we thank God for all the gifts that God has given us, including the space to express our anger and frustration. We thank God also for the material gifts, the gifts of time, money, and other things. And now we come to our time of offering where we give back just a portion of those gifts to God. of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight as we seek to draw near to you to hear from you in Christ's name we pray amen lament is a form of prayer it is a spiritual practice for holding the brokenness of the world and our lives before God.
Scott Ellington writes, we think prayer means presenting ourselves before God so that God will be pleased with us. So in our prayers, we put on our Sunday best and we use our manners. But prayers of lament don't observe these niceties. They are jarring, even violent, in their assault on decency and order. Lament doesn't lower its voice or speak civilly or wait its turn. Laments can be very angry. My good friend is a therapist, and she tells me that much of her practice is helping people learn to acknowledge, express, and manage their emotions, often anger. She says that anger in general is an acceptable emotion for men to feel. So as children, little boys are taught that it's okay to express anger and subsequently to suppress sorrow. On the other hand, girls are often taught implicitly and explicitly that it's okay for them to cry but not to be angry. Now, I know this is very gendered and it's, of course, a stereotype and not how all families work. My dad's family, for example, the Englands, that's my maiden name, they're known for running hot. In fact, my dad said to me just a few days ago, the Englands are known for their temper, you know. I was like, I know, Dad. When I was in 10th grade, I broke up with my longtime boyfriend, not the guy who hit me in the head with the jet ski, a different guy. My dad came home from work and I was tending a bonfire in the backyard. My dad walked over and said, what you doing? And I said, I'm burning Jason's stuff, we broke up. And in front of me was this pile of love letters and one of his t-shirts and a couple of stuffed animals and I had poured gasoline on it and set it on fire. And my dad said, I never liked that jerk anyway. <laughs> and then he went back in the house. In my family, it was okay to be out in the back, backyard tending a bonfire. Our passage of scripture for today comes from the book of Lamentations. If you've been with us over the course of this Lenten season, you know now that Lamentations is a very short book of five poems lamenting the destruction of the city of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. In these three poems, there are three characters. You remember what they are? The narrator, the woman who is the personification of the destroyed city, and a man we might get to. <laughs> That's right. Just as a reminder, the Babylonians didn't just destroy the city. They decimated the city. They surrounded it. They held it hostage for two years. People were starving, which is why at the end of our passage for today, the woman says, should women eat their offspring? It was so bad that people were starving. So Lamentations is like a funeral for the city of Jerusalem. Our reading for today begins in the middle of things. Kathleen O'Connor says, Chapter 2 bursts upon us like an angry storm advancing without warning. Chapter 1, of course, sets the stage for the storm. It draws us near to this weeping woman who has lost everything. We feel for her. She is suffering. The last line of chapter 1 is the woman speaking, and it says, Groaning in pain, body and soul, I've had all I can take. In chapter 2, the poem shifts away from the weeping woman toward God. And it's the narrator who is speaking, and essentially he rages against God on the woman's behalf. He blames God for what has happened to the woman. Chapter 2 is brutal. If you read the whole chapter, it's brutal. 
The narrator says in verse 3 from the message, God's anger raging, he broke Israel's arm and turned his back as the enemy approached. Verse 4, like an enemy, God aimed his bow, bared his sword, and killed our young men. Verbs of attack and destruction pile on top of each other. God casts down. God does not remember. God swallows up. God does not spare. God throws down in rage. These verbs accumulate as if the narrator is overcome with his own fury. Anger pours from him as he tries to understand the destruction that he sees. Kathleen O'Connor writes, he charges God with violent abuse. Now I'll pause right there and as an aside say, I don't believe God caused the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. But that's not what I'm talking about today. The first verse tells us why the narrator is so angry. It says, how the Lord in his anger has humiliated daughter Zion. Daughter Zion. This isn't just anyone who is suffering. It is daughter Zion, the city of Jerusalem. She is precious to God. You ever had the experience of having something terrible happen to you and you think, but God, I'm a Christian. I love you. I'm a pastor. I'm trying to live my life following you. Why would you do this to me? No wonder the narrator begins to lash out against God. While the narrator is depicting the assault, he is simultaneously charging God with infidelity. He is basically saying, God, you lack integrity. You lost control. What have you done? The narrator is holding God accountable for the devastation that has happened to Jerusalem. And we read this passage and it seems disrespectful to speak to God in this way. It makes us uncomfortable to read those words in church. But did you notice? The book of Lamentations is in the Bible. It is a litany, if you will, of anti-praise. It is raw and angry. Now find it interesting that in Lamentations, God doesn't defend God's self. It's very different from the lament in the book of Job. In the book of Job, you remember the story. He is lamenting the loss of his children and his livestock, and he hurls these accusations at God, and God answers him. And do you remember what God says? Were you there when I created the world? Tell me, Job, since you know so much. And then God goes on for a couple of chapters, kind of saying, you can't possibly understand, Job. But in Lamentations, God doesn't respond. God allows this torrent of anger to stand. In Lamentations, God only says one line, and it's in chapter 3, which is the most hopeful part of the book, and we'll get to it next week. But in chapter 2, the anger just hangs in the air unanswered. Ever been hurt or angry and you call up a friend to tell them what's happened, and immediately they start problem solving, and you get annoyed with them? Why? Because you just want them to listen, right? Not to fix it. Three years ago, Kate Bowler, who is a professor at Duke, was diagnosed with a terminal illness. She has written a profound book about her experience called Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies That I Have Loved. 
She talks about how people said terrible things to her after the diagnosis, things like, you, you caused this by your sin, or God is trying to teach you something. Isn't it wonderful that he's given you this gift? These misguided comments, she writes, didn't bother me nearly as much as the people who tried to fix my problem. She said the worst part was all the people who said, you gotta try this nutritional supplement. She said people actually mailed them to her house. B12 or whatever, we'll fix it. Lamentations doesn't try to solve the problem. It just allows the anger to hang in the air and it forces us to resist easy theologies like everything happens for a reason. It honors the struggle of those who have endured extreme suffering and wonder if God has abandoned them. When life falls apart, it's natural to be angry. So what do we do with all that anger? Well, unfortunately, we're prone to respond to our anger in unhealthy ways. At one extreme, we tend to deny our anger and repress it to the point of depression. Or at the other extreme, we express anger in verbal or physical abuse toward other people. So because of these two extremes, we fear our anger sometimes. Perhaps at other times we repress our anger because we conclude that there's not much we can do with it. Maybe the person who hurts you refuses to fess up or to ask for forgiveness. And it's true, we cannot control the behavior of other people. We can't change how they will respond. Yet Psalm 4 advises, don't let the sun go down on your anger. This wisdom calls us to reflect productively on our anger and to work through it. So what I'm suggesting is that anger is something we need to pay attention to. It's a warning sign that all is not well. It's a flashing red light, if you will, and lament is one way to express our anger before God and work through it. In your bulletin, you have this little sheet called Praying Our Anger. It comes from a dissertation called Resolving Anger Toward God, Lament as an Avenue Toward Attachment. It gives you some prayer practices. It lists the psalms of lament that you can pray out loud to protest against God. It also lists some prayer practices like standing with your legs set apart, hands clenched as fists ready to do battle. It encourages you to write out your prayers or to use another art form for expressing your anger before God. I invite you to take this home with you. Use it now if you need it, or put it in your Bible for a time that you might need it later. Lamentations gives voice to the raw, bitter rage that the Hebrews felt over the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. It rages against God, and it's found in our whole scriptures. Our relationship with God has an emotional dynamic to it that does at times resemble other human love relationships. I think about when Michael and I got married and we made this deal that if we got angry with one another we would not call other people and talk about it. We've tried to stick to that. We promised we will not call our mamas and talk about each other, right? Because the healthy response is to go directly to the people in your life you love, to express complaint, be they neurotic or legitimate, to express them in the relational space of trusting, intimate communion and connection. And only then can relationships acquire depth and resiliency and maturity. In the same way, expressing your anger with God is a sign of health and intimacy, faith, and trust. 
Anne Weems was a Presbyterian minister, writer, and worship leader. She published seven books or collections of poems to be used in worship. Years ago, Anne's son Todd was murdered on the night of his 21st birthday. Anne's grief nearly overwhelmed her. Her anger was profound. Her sorrow is vast as the sea. And her friend, Hebrew Bible scholar Walter Brueggemann, suggested that she write some psalms of lament. She was a poet, after all. Several months later, she sent him five psalms of lament. Then she threw the copies in a desk drawer and slammed the door shut. She said, I went for long periods without writing, but then I would pick up my pen and write another lament psalm, giving anguish, giving pen and paper to my anguish. Her laments eventually became a book called Psalms of Lament. There are copies of it out in the hallway if you want to pick it up and look through it. She writes in the introduction to the book, there is no salvation in self-help books. The help we need is far beyond self. Our only hope is to march ourselves to the throne of God and in loud lament cry out the pain in our souls. So in preparation for communion, let's hear these words from one of Anne's psalms of lament for her son. What do you want of me, God, who will not leave me alone? I am an emptied shell, beached and drained of life. I lie still, no longer even able to writhe in pain. I'm around the corner from death, and yet, oh God, you tell me to get up. You've entered me in the race again, and they're already announcing my name. Over and over, the loudspeaker blares. My head is splitting from the noise. Don't you know what bad shape I'm in? Don't you know I am weak and unable? Don't you even remember what I've been through? I am the one who has called your name over and over, but I had no loudspeaker. You did not hear my crying. Day after day and night after night, I called you, but you didn't answer. You slept while I wept. You could have saved me then, but now I am completely helpless. And this is the time you've chosen to tell me to get up and walk? I can't get up. I can't even move. It is too late to race again. Withdraw my name. Take me out of the race. Stop the loudspeaker. Leave me alone. Only a miracle could help me now. Only a miracle could help me now. Only a miracle could help me now. On the night that Christ was betrayed, he gathered his disciples around the table, and when he had given thanks, he took bread and he broke it and he said, take and eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do so remembering me.
we eat together the bread of heaven, the body of Christ. We drink together the blood of Christ, the cup of grace. God of wonder, you walk the heavens and light the sun in the early morning hours. With compassion, you tend our garden and our hearts. When all hope is buried, you work a miracle. You plant your strength in our weakness. You water our souls and we grow to the sun. And we run the race. O God of grace, thank, thank you. you. So with that strength that comes from knowing Christ, let's stand and greet one another and pass the peace of Christ. back to your seats. Let's pray together. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your loving kindness. and your gate, compassion, hear our prayers. We pray for the whole church all leaders and ministers and all holy people of God. Wash us through and through and cleanse us from our sin. We pray for our nation, for all the nations of the earth, for all who govern and judge. Purge us from our sin and we shall be pure. We pray for those who hunger, those who thirst, those who cry out to you for justice. Those who live under the threat of terror and those without a place to lay their head. Make them hear of joy and gladness that those who are broken may rejoice in you. We pray for those who are ill, those who are in pain, those who live under stress, and those who are lonely. Give them the joy of your saving help and sustain them with your bountiful spirit. We pray especially, God, for those in our community of faith who are hurting and in need. 
We continue to lift up Ed Rollins and Deb Carr and all their family as they mourn the loss of Ryan. Lord, we lift up Trish Blair, Barry Kausler, and Debbie Riley for strength as they undergo treatments for cancer. And for all those loved ones who are on our hearts and our minds today, we pray, God, that your presence and your care will be with them. Lord Jesus, you taught your disciples that unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. As we prepare our hearts to remember your death and resurrection, grant us the strength and wisdom to serve and follow you this day and always. And now we pray together as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing our hymn of commitment, number 642, I Want Jesus to Walk With Me. And as we stand and sing, I'll be here at the front today if you need prayer or if you're interested in becoming a part of the First Baptist family, I'd love to speak with you.